Thank you, Mace. Thank you, everyone. I'm Eve Ekman, so delighted to be here with you all tonight. I'm going to do a bit of a preamble for our sit tonight because it's it's really lovely. Um, I know I've said this many times, but this might be one of my favorite slogans. It aligns just so beautifully uh, with my life's work um, on confronting destructive emotions. So we're going to do a special meditation around destructive emotions, but I am sure many of you are coming kind of very much out of the day, which likely was also in front of the screen. So we're gonna do actually just a one minute together of settling in before I start talking. So inviting yourself to be here and present as though you were pouring your full attention into the space of your body. And all the various detritus of the mind, the planning, the thinking. Imagine that it's just dirt at the surface. And much like a glass of water, once we settle in the body, like settling a swirling glass of water, all that sediment and dirt will just naturally fall, revealing a clarity. A couple more moments here to really notice what's in the body, not just at the level of temperature, warmth or coolness or aches and pains, but notice how the body is feeling at the level of our subtle body. The subtle body is that porousness between the outside world, its news, its confrontations, its opportunities, and our inner world, the felt sensations, and physical manifestations of how we communicate, interpret, and understand this world we live in. So a couple moments here to attend with gentle curiosity to the subtle body. Feel or imagine as though you could unwind and release behind the eyes. Feel or imagine as though you were loosening between the shoulder blades. Feel or imagine a warmth and dissolving of tension at the chest and the heart area. And feel or imagine the sensation of stability, solidity and presence at the belly. And we'll take one moment here to situate ourselves. August 18th and 2021 in the conventional calendar time. 
gathering here together in whatever room or space we are in, feeling that space around you. And then feeling this unique virtual connection, this web of connection together. And while still maintaining some presence of awareness in the subtle body, let's regather ourselves together, wiggling fingers and toes, blinking eyes, open. Welcome again. So as I mentioned tonight, gosh, I just love this slogan. So I'm gonna put it here in the chat. Don't judge me for loving this slogan. Uh, always meditate on whatever provokes resentment. I just think this is so juicy. Really like resentment, it's just such a, um, coarse and grating feeling in our mind you know it just it just creates um yes it's actually 49 we're on 49 now uh it creates such a uh a dis-ease it's like a really uncomfortable sensation on the skin resentment just gives us it gives us no peace and resentment can be so insidious it's as though we don't even recognize it's there. We will explore a little from the teachings around what is said of how to work with this practice. But the reason I wanted to give a bit of preamble is, is I find, especially with Tonglen practices, which is the essence of Lojong, this giving and receiving, this how do we turn towards what is hard and transform it through practicing with our breath and our mind through our heart. Often with these practices, which are imaginal practices, engaging our creative uh, capacity in our mind, sometimes we really struggle in the moment to come up with our good examples. So I want to give you a little bit of time to consider. So in this practice specifically, we can look at a couple different targets of our resentment. And the target of our resentment is someone, especially in, in the case of this slogan, someone who we know, someone who we're close to, and someone who maybe not all the time, but some of the time feel resentment towards. And this slogan, you know, it's given its whole own point and purpose because it's believed that when we have resentment towards someone we care about, it's extra bad karma. And when we say that, it's, it's not just this idea of, of you're going to be punished in another lifetime. Think about karma as just the law of cause and effect. Holding resentment towards someone who's close to you means there's a lot of opportunities to have that dis-ease of the mind. So when we look at these destructive, sometimes defiling emotions, so much of this Lojong practice is encouraging us of how can we unwind? With these emotions blocking and obscuring our perception, we have no, we have no access to our innate compassion. So when we think about generating and developing compassion, it's very helpful to think of not just, I need to build this thing, it's I need to clear the space so that compassion arises. So when we're doing our Tonglen practice, uh, the flavor I'd like to bring for us this evening is actually one where we can bring forth that resentment. So bring it to clarity 
so insidious, often it's just kind of right behind us. So we bring forth that resentment and we are able to notice the impact at the subtle body level. And so I wanna explain just a tiny bit about the subtle body. Many of you who, um, who are we together in going through Sukhni Rinpoche's wonderful book, he talked in a great deal about subtle body. But for others of us, it might be a really unfamiliar term. So subtle body, actually it's <laughs> when we feel exhausted at the end of a day of Zoom, the so-called Zoom fatigue, that is subtle body fatigue. That's not your body tired, right? You didn't go anywhere, you were in front of a screen. That's the subtle body. That's not being hungry, that's not being tired, that's not having achy back, that's not exercising too hard. And it's not just mental fatigue. We're just talking and having meetings like we always do. What the subtle body is picking up on is all these other effortful cues that are missed and other effortful needs of over explaining ourselves. So we can think about the subtle body as kind of this porousness, as I said in our opening meditation, between how we experience the world and process it, which can in other terms be called our emotions, right? Our emotions are our response to the world when we sense something important is happening to us. And how do we sense something important is happening? It's a full body experience. How do we then experience emotions? It's a full body experience. We might not be displaying it or showing it. So we think about Zoom fatigue, I'll just use that example since I think it's familiar, relevant and poignant for many of us. We're often missing out on these really important subtle cues. Like right now, I, I can't hear any of you breathe. I can see some of your facial expressions, that's helpful, but also it's really kind of hard to tell without being able to see your arms and your body moving. So I'm missing out on a lot of nonverbal cues. And then the other thing that's exhausting is there's nothing as intimate as looking face to face with someone. And with Zoom, we have the kind of intimacy with one another that usually we reserve only for people we really care about when talking about something enormously important. And so that emotional energy of being seen and seeing, being seen and seeing, it's exhausting at the subtle body level because it's exhausting at the emotional level. So that's one way to kind of tune in to what is it that we're looking towards when we want to work with our subtle body. So in this meditation, again, I get, I would love for you to kind of take a couple moments and prepare who is someone close to you that you occasionally feel resentment for. You might even be sitting in the same room as them. It's okay. And to really, you know, kind of prime the pump for this subtle body experience. So we'll do a, just a little experiment so we can get a, have a sense of that subtle body. So if we imagine, don't need to close your eyes, but imagine watching a beautiful, beautiful sunset. Maybe feeling that golden light on you. Do you notice anything in the body? Does anybody notice anything in the body just imagining something beautiful? Raise your hand, see some nods. So that's great, sensitive, subtle bodies, but I'm sure <laughs> we notice something in the subtle body and I'm sorry to bring this up, but there's nothing outside of our Dharma. So what do we feel in the body when we think about some of the horrors and fears around Afghanistan right now? Where do you feel that? Not in the mind, but in the body. Yeah, chest, I feel it in my face. I feel it in my throat, right? So that's our subtle body. We didn't do anything, but that is how we are experiencing. And I think about all of us, some um, you know, doing frontline provider work in our schools and hospitals and otherwise, and all of us doing the frontline work of watching the horror of the news. That is impacting our subtle body. And the way that we work with our subtle body is actually like, this will sound familiar, it is turning towards it, giving it space, 
allowing those sensations to naturally release. It's too bad it doesn't work for us to just distract and avoid. If it did, none of us would be here. We've already tried that, right? So our subtle body, those things that build up, if we just try to avoid and do the next thing, next, we wake up in the middle of the night, we find ourselves kind of flying off the handle at nothing. So we actually have to turn towards and attend to the charge. So tonight we're going to be bringing forth this idea or image of our feeling of resentment, almost just so that we can kind of have an experiment of what is this subtle body like when we feel resentment? And then we'll spend time doing a practice that Sokni Rinpoche has taught and which I love, this handshake with emotion. And a handshake means we are just meeting the emotion. We're not pushing it away. We're not trying to embrace it. We're just meeting it. And when we meet it, we aren't having a dialogue. We're not arguing our point. I mean, resentment, because it's in the anger family, oof, it has an urgency. We believe we're right, and we're right, right now. So to help ourselves kind of get out of that cycle, that delusion, right, that we are right, and there's another who's wrong, tending to the body, tending to the body. And as we do so, and we watch these sensations arise and dissipate, what we prepare for is the ground of compassion. So instead of, I'm mad at this person because they did or didn't do this thing that I really wanted them to do or not do. Oh, but I have compassion for them because, you know, look at all their shit. I know them so well. Like that's a cognitive override. Instead, it's this person who didn't do this thing I wanted or didn't want. Let me feel that. Let that feeling dissipate naturally and then watch if compassion arises. So it's a subtle difference, same, same outcome, but that really is a beautiful way for us to kind of be with our frustrations and resentments, right? And uh, some of us in this um, Sangha are, um, I'd say enormous fans of the work of Resma Menachem and I, really see a lot of his, um, his wisdom in this practice. So he's a trauma therapist, author, activist, and teacher. And he invites us to work with our traumas through the body, very aligned, this idea of how do we work with our felt experiences through releasing in the body. So that is a whole lot of preamble. We're gonna go ahead and get ready for our practice. Do you have someone in mind you resent? You've had some time to think about it? Okay, good. You won't be caught off guard. Okay. So let's once again, invite ourselves to a posture. And for this practice, you know, you're welcome to, you know, dim your screen if that's helpful. You can turn to the side, like find whatever really works for you. We'll dive right in here, again, pouring our attention and awareness into the body.
So notice the qualities of sensations in the body. Some that are more coarse or obvious, such as warmth and coolness, maybe the weight of wherever your seat is touching a cushion or a couch. And other sensations are more subtle. Maybe they feel like tingling. See if you can be very curious, almost as though you were an explorer in a new territory. Investigate. What is the territory of felt sensations throughout the body right now? You may notice that there are certain areas where there is sensation that feels more alive. And there may also be a sense that there are certain sensations that are throughout the entire body, a sense of the body as a whole. As you notice, maybe you become more relaxed. Maybe you notice what feels as though it is becoming relaxed. Are there certain areas which give way, release tension? A couple more moments here. Just calibrating this inner instrument of noticing the body from within the body. And we'll shift our attention now. And bring to mind a time in which we experienced a sense of resentment, frustration, annoyance. When someone who we know well acted in a way that really felt harmful, hurtful, frustrating, or annoying to us.
Bring this memory to mind. See if you can recall what exactly happened or didn't happen. Can you recall what you were thinking and feeling at that moment? Resentment often creates a proliferation of thoughts, many thoughts. Maybe some of them are barging their way in right now. Our purpose here is to get a little taste or flavor of that resentment. So let those thoughts in. And notice how bringing this memory and thoughts to mind, they start to shift and change even the muscles in your face. Maybe the brow starts feeling tight and cinched together. Maybe the jaw wants to tighten and lock in. Couple more moments here. We're really bringing in this memory, allowing it to fully light up our felt experience, our mind, our heart, our body. Feel the impact in the body. Where do you notice sensations? What are the quality of these sensations? And though it may be a bit sticky, try to release this memory and thoughts of resentment and return your full attention to the body, noticing whatever impact you may notice as we feel into the body here, we're feeling into the subtle body and how our thoughts memories and images can stir up our emotional state and really shift the entire energy in the body. Notice the back of the neck. Notice the chest. Notice the belly. Notice the hands. The thoughts and memory may want to return and continue to be analyzed. Keep releasing them and shake hands now or meet whatever sensations arise in the body. Feel or imagine that these sensations have all the space they need.
For some of us, this may feel quite intense, many different textures, many different feelings in the body. And for others of us, less so, maybe more dull. Whatever is the felt experience, keep noticing. Especially noticing how these sensations shift and change and maybe even dissipate. Although it feels as though these sensations have only the space of our body, feel or imagine as though they could release and unfold into the space around us, below and above, in front of and behind. Keep returning your attention to the body, sensations in the body. Keep watching and noticing and inviting the sensations to release and shift and dissipate. As we observe and notice, and make space for these sensations in the subtle body. Is it possible to touch into and notice just a subtle sense of kindness and care? Our intrinsic care for our own well being. that care which brought us here tonight, that care which feeds us and bathes us and moves us through the world. Bring that care to the surface, to the forefront of the mind. And 
And as you breathe in, imagine breathing in this natural, innate elixir of care, kindness. And as you breathe out, imagine just feeling that permeate and radiate through the body. Inhaling kindness and care, exhaling gentleness and ease. And keep noticing sensations in the body. Can you feel or notice the experience of care and kindness through the subtle body? Feel or imagine the natural spaciousness of this warmth and kindness. Feel or imagine a subtle smile or large smile on the lips. Inviting that smile to the heart. And then inviting that smile to the belly. Once more, refreshing your interest and curiosity to the sensations in your body right now.
Thank you for your practice. But yeah, I would be curious to hear any questions or reflections, either in the chat or by raising your hand. Jason. Thank you so much, Eve. Uh, I really feel um, connected to this and resonate with it resentment mantra, you know, the whole concept of, um, I mean, let me try to be clear. Um, I have a ton of resentment and it's really cropping up around specific issues with, with work related stuff. Um, and it, that taps into this deeper current of trauma. And I'm actually realizing that um, my behavior has to change and I'm having a really hard time figuring out what it is that has to change because it's almost like I come up against, I, I feel this way about resistance too. Resentment mm. and resistance are related where I can't, I'm actually realizing more now that I actually, I don't know what I need to do in order to change my behavior. And it's, and I can meditate and I can, work with it and but you know sometimes it's just like wow this really has me by the it has a grip on me and so you know during the meditation at one point i re i felt a release and it was very real it was body it was a subtle body release but i'm kind of like um i'm at a point where i want to be able to will that or so i want to be able it, it takes so much effort in a sense to find peace with it and usually yeah. resentment will make me clench immediately mm -hmm. right so um anyway i guess i'm just really feeling like the things that are happening in my life right now make me respond in a really bad way like i'm doing the things that i know i shouldn't be doing and all this other stuff so <sighs> i'm sort of at the mercy of it you know it's like i have to surrender to it um but anything that you can share about yeah uh, Chandra said last week something about 60 40, mm -hmm. which was very helpful. It was like when you're when you're sort of like standing next to somebody in a line for coffee and you can actually use this tool 60 40. How much of myself is, is inward, calm before I speak? And I guess it's also the pause because when I'm feeling resentment or resistance, I don't pause. I just like, poof. and so I'm kind of like looking for little little helpers along the way. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Mm -hmm. I so appreciate your, um, your heartfelt desire and honesty around wanting to change and seeing it and seeing that grip of it. Um, and I, I, it's funny because you answered your own question, right? You, that's the unfortunate thing is we all actually know the tools. It's not, that's not the issue. And so I, I wish I had a, a better answer for you. It's gonna be super unsatisfying, but it is continuing to cultivate meta-awareness. So we have to have that meta-awareness, which is right when we feel that fireball entering like the stream, like it's the whole thing, which some of you might have noticed during the meditation. It's not like anger is just happening here. Like it's right, we can feel it throughout all of the nadis, through all the subtle body, through our nervous system and the contemporary way of talking about it. And we are pretty much, um, it's already too late if we notice it when we're acting or behaving. When our tone of voice gets like this, or for some of us, myself, like if we're doing that passive aggressive thing, like we've, you know, that's like, um, my dad, who some of you know, is a, a, a psychologist who really focused a lot of his life on emotions. He would say, being aware of our anger after we've been angry, that's kindergarten. It's important, right, to be aware of it after uh, and kind of make a repair or reflect. But we want to get to high school 
And high school is noticing it when it's like in your body and it's like that contraction and not reacting. And that may not feel like you've gotten very far, but it's a big difference between kindergarten and high school in terms of the impact and, and harm for ourselves and for others, right? And the momentum. And then, you know, graduate school and beyond is really being able to see it. And in that, I'd say the best training is to start with things that are small. So there is nothing too small for our frustration. <laughs> nothing, you know, it's unbelievable. Like it's windy out today. You can be really frustrated about that wind. Like, ah, oh, it's like for me, I was out or I was like, oh, my hair, it's like, ugh. You know, and noticing even there, like, can I notice when it starts to kind of, it's almost like a, a dye, a color dye in our mind stream, that anger. Can we notice right as it starts to um, kind of, yeah, really permeate the way we see everything. And that is, that's the only, because again, there's tools and tricks and, and they're great, but they don't matter at all if we don't know how to use them. And that is why you see such a huge emphasis in, you know, across cognitive behavior therapies, across psychotherapy to practice mindfulness, because we do, you know, we do have to be able to feel at that um, kind of, you know, more and more granular level when our emotion is arising, what it feels like in the body and our tendency towards it. And your wisdom with it of like surrender to its power that is huge. Fighting it, right? That creates, it's almost like you're just trying to not make things worse and then start to learn. And, and I will say resentment teaches us a lot. I think it's a oversimplification to say we're only angry at others for what we find is similar to ourselves. Like that's just not always true, but there is something to learn about our frustrations and our sticky places too. So when it's not just me and you anger, we're going head to head, I'm gonna take you down, but more, you know, the surrender and also like, yeah, in, in one of the um, verses, you know, describing how we use this Lojong, it's, you know, anger is your guru. This resentment is your guru. Um, what, are you, what are you gonna learn from this specific guru? Not meaning it's the only thing you learn from, but what can you learn from this? So that I hope I hope some of that is helpful. Yeah, it's very helpful. And I'll just say one more thing about it, which is that when I did kind of recognize, have a chance to reflect on it, go over the resentment I was feeling, it was all sadness. It was all like, I'm just really sad that whatever I wanted isn't happening because I and it's this per. I, and then I'm projecting onto the person. It's like you're the one. I'm pissed off and I'm resentful because you're the one right the blame you're the one that's making me not get what i want and that whole cycle yeah. is so um it's insidious it happens like boom it happens instantly and i have to kind of go like oh i'm just feeling sad because i don't get what i want very good noticing very good noticing so much of our resentment is i'm not heard i'm not seen i'm not felt in the way right there's an expectation that's being missed um, yeah, and it, and it is, you know, what we, when we brought forth that kindness in our practice, um, that's kind of, in some ways, it's kind of soothing that part of us that gets so riled up, you know, really kind of tending to it because it's not just that, oh, I feel angry and I shouldn't, it's, I feel angry and this is terrible. <laughs> this feels terrible. And I care about the fact that it feels terrible. So yeah, keep us posted. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions or reflections on that practice? Yes, Claudia. Um, I feel 
my body as my reaction to something that irritates me or, or I have a resentment against or for. I feel it creeping up in my body, but sometimes it's too late and I do react with harsh speech or, you know. Uh, and then I go into my meditation and I try to understand with, where this person is coming from. But then I get angry because I feel, well, okay, this person might be coming from this and she suffered this or that, but that doesn't justify blah, 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 you know? So, I mean, in a very not emotional, but more of a cognitive way, yeah. I try to, if you want, kind of like beg or ask for, to be able to have compassion. Mm. but it's not really always coming from the subtle body or you know it's it's more here it's not always in the heart so do you have any recommendations I mean I, sometimes I try to just feel it and then the the, the compassion does show up but not yeah. always not yeah always. I, I think you already know yeah, like again, you know, you're 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 describing it and especially for those close to us. I mean, that's why I love how juicy this is that it's it's not just those people doing those bad things out there. It's the people we love who are frustrated at, right? Because so we don't, you know, the justifications and all of that in the moment and the, you know, refractory period, the intensity of our emotion, we just can't see it. But once our whole system, our, our, our physiology has calmed down, we can see. And occasionally someone really has done something wrong and we do need to talk to them about it. But that's what, like 5% of the time maximum, you know, usually our resentments are, are this, you know, just as Jason said, like, oh, I'm hurt. Like, how come you didn't, why, wait. You know, like there's a, there's a part of us that just is, you know, not met. How could we, how could we always meet another person? We just can't. And so we inevitably create these inconsistencies. And I'm not saying, you know, um, as I, I love to quote Pema Chodron's, like, don't practice doormat compassion. So don't use compassion to then become a doormat and, oh, it's okay. Like they can treat me however they want and walk all over me. No, no. But it's really, you know, being honest with ourselves about the nature of our resentments um, and, and investigating. And I think, I think you're right on, Claudia, that often we want to think our way through. And Shanti Deva would say, thinking about our anger is kerosene on the fire. You know, it's like not the right tool, um, just given how much, how literally hijacked we get by our emotion experiences. So, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I, I could probably teach um, like at least a year on anger because there's so much nuance. There's just so much there. And even in the recent um, summit, uh, this Science and Wisdom of Emotion Summit, that I got to participate in recently, which was all about the kind of Buddhist and contemplative science approach to emotion, anger. These guys who I was getting to talk with have been thinking about this for 20, 30 years plus. They still don't agree on whether occasionally anger is okay and or what we should do about it and when's the right time to intervene and what are the right antidotes. There's a lot of nuance there. so. If you feel confused, you're in really good company, um, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I wanna, I'll, I'll share a couple more, more things here, which is um, another way that this, uh, this slogan is described is, <laughs> I just like the kind of, I'd say poetry of this always meditate on those who make you boil. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm, I hope that you all could feel some of that rich texture in the body of our emotion. 
it's really interesting to kind of get and I like you know boiling and heat and there's a lot of words that we have to describe that felt experience um, and that is really useful when they you know in, in different in different interpretations they talk about um, the importance of the people that we're close to so that's what we've been focusing on but we could also, they also say that it's important to meditate on the people you resent kind of for no reason. Like you don't even know them and they haven't done anything to you and you already don't like them. I found that really normalizing. I was like, oh good, it's not just me. Like, what is that? Why do we sometimes just not like people? Like there's just a kind of like, oh. And you know, the invitation here to meditate on, on that and not to figure out, but to really hold these folks in mind. So the instructions with this are Tonglen, right? And our Tonglen practice is a turning towards a transformation. The Tonglen practice isn't, huh, I wonder if I don't like them because they remind me of that bully in second grade, or maybe it's that, like, no, it's a turn towards transform. But I think that that's a really interesting one, like an interesting aspect of, being part of a, um, you know, larger community is like, there are a certain amount of people who just by whatever, we don't like them. And this is outside of people who have bias and prejudice and otherwise that's really informing, like that's actually an informed resentment. This is just, yeah, I kind of I don't like that. I wish they wouldn't move their shopping cart that way. Like what's wrong? like, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, so I think that's a really interesting one. And for us, you know, all of us to kind of, to look at it. As many of you know, I, I really enjoy uh, focusing on our, con our contempt. So contempt is a little different than anger. Contempt is a feeling of superiority, being better than. And I think that's quite insidious. Many of us are not aware of when we're kind of placing ourselves above another. This is uh, otherwise known as using social media. Um, at least I have noticed that trend, right? We are just holding and harboring a lot of preference and judgment and, and otherwise. But this, this resentment of people we don't know, it's interesting. It's really interesting. I'm curious, does anybody here, like when I bring that up, does, does that ring a bell? Does that resonate? Yeah. It's strange. It is strange, yeah. And then there's another type here, which is kind of probably a lot more um, familiar to us, which is uh, the resentment of people that we feel in competition with. And that's like a hard one, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a, a juicy one, I would say. I, it's not one I think about a lot. Um, and one of the um, commentators on this, I think it was actually Alan Wallace's commentary on this around, you know, someone who you feel you're in direct competition with for some amount, of, some valued thing, and this kind of resentment you have to them. And it brings forth a desire for them to not do well and to not succeed. I think it's a it's a really uh, it's a really challenging one. It's uh, I I have been thinking about competition a bit recently, um, partially because of the Olympics, <laughs> and and partially just because of, of capitalism. And you know, is there such thing as healthy competition? Can we indeed be competitive with one another in a way that it, that is wholesome? Uh, or does it always lead towards these resentment? And if we had a completely non-competitive world, would we not do our best, not succeed in some way or another? I'm just not sure. <laughs> uh, I like, uh, it's nice to see you all. 
And I like your comment here, going on social media to find opinions, right? Like, it's not just like, oh, I'm on social media to catch up with my friends. Like, no, I'm going there in order to feel resentment and contempt. (laughs) Because that is, you know, one other part of what Jason was saying, um, which is, wow, I'm noticing there's a sadness before my resentment. Sadness has no energy. Sadness doesn't feel empowered. Resentment's like, ooh, I got something now. Now I'm cooking with with real fire, right? It actually gives us a sense of efficacy. So whether it's conscious or not, most of us don't want to hang out in the despair. We are in times of despair, friends. We are. We have been, but it just continues. And it's really, really tough to hang in that despair. And it is really tempting to go to blame and to go to resentment. And, um, you know, I, I was thinking the other day of about just how hard it must be uh, for folks outside the United States um, and just the hypocrisy of, of our country on so many levels. But thinking of it about us as, uh, you know, our contribution to the global emissions and our lack of full responsibility to that. And um, I wouldn't fault anyone who felt enormous resentment towards our country and towards our behaviors. I mean, internally I do as well. And I think it's, again, it's just this really um, interesting feature of anger has a certain kind of power, a certain kind of energy and force that's useful And it also can really create a closed loop of urgency, contraction, and violence. So when we think about violence and aggression, that isn't coming out of sadness. That isn't necessarily even coming out of fear. It requires anger. That is the motivating force behind all aggression and violence. So the anger, needless to say, has such a... a, a difficult and challenging place for us to hold it. One traditional way of talking about anger in in the Buddhist tradition is saying it's like a hot coal on bare hands. It's like it's that hard to hold. And how do we how do we hold our anger in a way? Because we also know that anger is behind the most important social justice movements of our world not maybe enacted with violence though sometimes, but that anger is what really motivates sometimes what's called a clear seeing. Some, I maybe, and that's, again, it's just so sticky because it's like, oh yeah, I'm angry and I see clearly and I'm right and you're wrong. It's not that, uh, it's not that it's, but it, there is with anger, just there can be these um, experiences of absolutely not. We can't do this. This is not right. So it's just so tough for us to track at an internal level the anger that's giving way to really meaningful kind of boundary lines, clarity, and the anger that's you know letting us in some ways indulge in hatred and resentment. So one distinction that's made in, in Buddhism around anger is with intent to ill will and harm. That kind of anger is the anger that's truly destructive, right? Whereas there can be anger without that ill will and harm, anger that's either kind of temporary and fleeting or anger that actually inspires something wholesome that does give us the energy to move forward. Okay, that's, that's a lot of ideas, questions, thoughts. I'd really love to hear. Oh, I see something from Joe. Joe says, my main resentment is about a situation with someone I love that isn't reciprocal for me. I internalize the blame and feel sadness and shame about it mostly. My therapist keeps nudging me towards feeling into some anger. This meditation where you had us notice the self-protective care that inwardly lines resentment was helpful. It helped me find that softness beneath the discomforting experience of anger. 
and I see that I was worth protecting too. Oh, thank you, Joe. That is so beautiful. Yeah. I, I have a lot of struggle with uh, therapeutic approaches that encourage anger. Um, whether that's, you know, kind of, you know, in the, I think in the late seventies, it was like beating stuff out with Nerf bats. And currently it's like this, you know, boxing and I get it. Like, I get that it can be powerful to release energy. And sometimes those pathways that we build create their own momentum. Um, it's tough because anger, again, it can be that lift up and clear seeing, but if we're directing it towards a person, it's always partially wrong. You know, it really, we can resent it towards actions and behaviors. So one other way, like I love to think of this teaching is the way that we feel resentment towards ourselves. It's okay if we resent certain ways of being or things we do or habits we're stuck in. But if we resent ourselves, if we're really angry at ourselves, it's not a way to move forward. And it's not, it's not true, right? There's not, a, there's not a, a way for us to be truly angry at ourselves. It's, that's um, actually clear seeing of our entirety. Yeah. This part of internalizing the blame though, Joe, I really, I can really relate to that. I think, um, <sighs> you know, needless to say, as, as with every emotion, but anger especially is, uh, it can be very gendered. It can be very influenced by various cultural factors. And so who believes they are allowed to, maybe because of the family you were born in or the messages you got from society and culture, who believes they're allowed to express anger and not? And for folks who don't believe they're allowed to express anger, there's like this internal combustion. And sometimes that's self-blame and self-hatred and um, you know, often it's, it's sadness. I read this wonderful piece written by a woman talking about her anger and saying how she always would wait so long to show her anger that it would end up crying. And then people would feel bad for her and she wasn't able to actually express her power because she'd been so conditioned to not be angry and the sadness came instead. Um, so I do think it's interesting. I do think it would be quite powerful for all of us to be able to have like a healthy feel of what our anger is like without needing to kind of dip all the way into it. Um, so I do think a handshake practice is lovely for that, in that we can notice this is part of the range of human experience. It's not wrong. It's natural. Um, that kind of self-blame or self-resentment, oh, it is such a sticky one. It's a lot like anxiety. But I think it's even actually more destructive, to be honest. But anxiety is very destructive, don't get me wrong. But the self-blame, because it just sidles up to shame, right? So we're angry at ourselves, but then we also think we're bad. And that makes it feel as though we're different and separate. And therein lies the whole problem, right? Our whole sense of um, separateness, our whole sense of not belonging or being different. It's just so painful. It makes it really impossible. So I, um, yeah, I think it's really great to see it clearly. And I, I don't know, uh, I'm, I'm not your therapist um, and I'm not a, you know, I, it's hard to say, but I, it's hard for me to think that anger is the right way. Dignity, integrity, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. I see from Heidi, um, it's a fine line between anger and fierce love. Mm, a mother might have in protecting her child, the Tara Dakini kind of loving energy. Yes. And I'm, I'm happy to say, you know, I think there's 
kind of more, I've seen more even in the public discourse um, around fierce compassion. And of course, that is an aspect of compassion. And I think especially, you know, I, I love the example of the parent, because that's such a wonderful example of anger that's protective and helpful. It's in a cause of good. And so it's not as though you're like, I can't believe you almost ran across the street and then you're resentful for the next week. <laughs> it's, you know, you see your child almost cross the street, you yell and you run. And then in that moment, there is full force of anger, but that's it. You don't stick with it. So it's, you know, our, our natural course of any emotion, anger included, is for it to rise and to fall. And that's where resentment is so different. Resentment isn't something you feel once, it's that festering. It's that ongoing slow boil. We keep adding more fuel to the fire to keep it going, right? There's a, there's a lot of kind of willful or habitual conditioned momentum there. And, you know, I actually think it's a really big feat to be a grown up without resentment. All of us have been wronged and felt wronged and felt, you know, and so how do we not let that build up and kind of create this feeling? It's really tough. It requires that we're kind of going in and cleaning out a lot. And, you know, I was listening to a beautiful talk by some of you might know um, a local Tibetan teacher here by the name of Anam Thupten. Um, I'll put him in here because I have a feeling. Such a lovely teacher. He has a, a center out in Point Richmond. And he was um, talking today about this uh, term that I've, I've heard before, uh, but I loved hearing it. This idea that our freedom, one way to cultivate our freedom is saturating our mind with wholesome mental states. So I think we also have to do the work of kind of, you know, parsing apart our resentments and anger and understanding them and making space and then also complementary is saturating our mind with these beautiful mental states. And he says, we do so by remembering the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha, right? So kind of really kind of rejoicing in the three jewels. It's a really nice uh, alternative to um, some, of the other, some of the other ways we can give into our, our resentments. Um, so yeah, Heidi, thank you for bringing that up. I think it's it's really important to see the value of that kind of fierce energy. And like anything, we don't want to um, overutilize one area, right? If we are a if we're a weightlifter, we don't only work on our right arm, and then we just let our left arm and our legs, you know, whatever. Who cares? Um, then we'll have to kind of pull ourselves away or pull ourselves through the world with just our right arm. So I think fierce compassion has an enormously uh, amazing and powerful um, role in our life. And so for those of you who are not familiar, I think the easiest, simplest way to describe it is we know that compassion has many arms, sometimes associated with 999 arms at least. So when we have that uh, 999 arms, these arms actually carry different tools for our compassion. So let's say I have a friend who went through a terrible breakup and they feel, they feel really sad. It might be that what they need is a beautiful cup of tea and a bouquet of flowers. It might be that what they need is a really hard talking to of, good thing you got out of that relationship. It was bringing you down, let's go out, right? So compassion manifests in these different ways. Sometimes it's, it can be fierce and it's so helpful because otherwise, especially in, in the worlds that I sometimes tread in, like um, healthcare, um, there's this idea that compassion is squishy and soft. It's just being nice. No, <laughs> compassion is a clear seeing of suffering and a desire to alleviate that suffering by whatever means necessary. And in order to do that effectively, we need empathy. We need to know what's, what's being asked of us. Um, okay, so Terrell, uh, I can relate to internalizing blame, worrying more about the way someone else feels before actually respecting my own feelings. Ooh, -wee, I can relate to that. And, and I will say one just classic recipe of resentment is giving too much, 
right? And like always thinking about the other and imagining and anticipating others' needs and fulfilling it before they're asked. And then it just doesn't feel reciprocal, doesn't feel like it's met and seen. And man, yeah, that is a that is an incredible way to, to really resent it. But I think, you know, Terrell, what you're, what you're highlighting here is, um, which is a pitfall for, I'd say, for many of us is it can be so much easier for us to care for others than ourselves. So much easier. And it's beautiful that we care for others and ourselves. And I actually do think, you know, there's this, you know, classic adage, you can't love someone else, you can love ourselves. And it's like, all right, good luck. When am I going to love someone next lifetime? Um, I do think we can learn how to love ourselves better through how we love others. We don't have to be this complete self-love actualization in order to love others. And I, I love, again, just these classic instructions for compassion practice and loving kindness practice. It's, you know, you are able to start feeling the kindness and compassion to yourself by imagining someone you care about. Think about how someone that you care about, how they would like to receive love. Then you turn that right back on yourself. So you can learn about how to treat yourself by the ability to care for others. Because when we care for others, there's just a little bit less of that judgment and kind of um, sense of responsibility. You know, we see them as they are. How amazing if we can pull ourselves back from ourselves, see our whole experience. It gives us so much compassion. And this is what you see in, in studies, both of compassion and in psychedelics, where people have this moment where there's some ego dissolution. Doesn't mean they completely uh, evaporate. It means they see themselves as a whole. Oh yeah, I'm that person with all that stuff. And this is just how I move through the world. Oh, how sweet, how precious. I'm just, just doing my best. So it's really, um, yeah, really incredible for us to try to find our way to that kind of love we show to others and then bring it right back to ourself. Um, yes. Wow. Okay. Uh, Claudia, I listened to him. Some people are probably familiar with Dharma Seed. If you ever want to lose yourself for like 75 years of practice, I mean, it's like, it's pretty overwhelming. I've actually never seen a Tibetan teacher on there before. I was surprised. Uh, usually it's primarily insight teachers, um, but Anam Thupten has a couple there. That's where I listen to it. These are all recordings made at retreats. It's a really nice way to spend a day listening to practices. They have old practice. I was listening for practices of Ajahn Chah. Some of you may know as the teacher of like Jack Cornfield and Joseph Goldstein. And they have some beautiful recordings of Ajahn Chah um, speaking Thai and translated. It's Anyway, very nourishing. What about caregiving? What about caregiving? What's the, <laughs> tell me more, Num. <laughs> I realized when I typed that you were in the middle of a story, but you wouldn't know which story you were in the middle of. Uh -huh. Just that, that, you know, you can have relationships that feel unbalanced when they needn't be like, you know, with a friend or a lover or something, but sometimes you're a caregiver and then yeah. you can, and, but you can feel resentment toward the person who you're, you know, caring for, even though you totally get that they need care and you're their caregiver, you know, it can go both ways. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And, you know, there like happily is quite a lot of um, efforts at trying to support caregivers because especially like caregivers of, um, you know, kids with significant disabilities, either neurological or otherwise, or caregivers who have spouses who are suffering from um, early onset dementia. Those are two studies I know about. And there's actually an accelerated rate of um, aging at the level of telomeres for caregivers, often, not all the time. And so when they look at who are the caregivers for whom that resentment or that, I mean, there's a lot, there's not just resentment probably in those caregiving cases, sadness and frustration otherwise, but, um, and there is, you know, the, the way that like kind of one of the main principles of how to work with that level of stress and, and giving is what's called meaning-based coping. So continually reminding oneself of why this is important and why it matters. 
since it isn't reciprocal and it isn't even kind of saying, you know, I'm, I'm here because I love this person and it matters. The other cool thing in, in some of those studies is they found that people who have a high co-occurrence of joy, even amid the difficulty, also do quite well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like you can be going through a horrific time with your loved one who's really sick and still find moments of joy and beauty. Mm -hmm. Kind of back to Anand Dupton, saturate your mind and mm -hmm. in wholesome mental states. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Walt says, directing resentment and anger towards others can be self-protective. Since being resentful and shameful <laughs> towards oneself from which one cannot escape or take respite in, the worst cases can lead to ending one life. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that sentiment because it, it can be, we can realize for, for, you know, some amount of time, we might need our anger to get through, to have that self-protection, especially if we're being threatened, right? We might need that anger to get through. Anger though does like, it has its own corrosive capacity. So as much as it might protect us from the outside in some ways, um, it does, it really like, it wears down our system. My guess, I haven't seen good research on this is, you would see a greater decline in cardiac functioning and higher rates of cardiac disease with higher instances of anger. They've studied that for type A people and I associate type A people with frustrated people, but I could be wrong. Um, so I just, I think we, we look at that uh, other impact, but anger is self-protective. It just, it cuts off so much though. Often with our anger and especially with resentment, it's so pervasive that we just lose track, you know? Um, we're unable to kind of have any, like not any, but we don't have as much space around other things. So when we feel anger and anger is going on for us, we can't at that same moment feel joy or feel kindness. Of course, the anger isn't always if we have self-protective anger but it's kind of tough for other states to kind of get in there uh, and permeate us. I do think, you know, anger, um, especially towards someone who's been harmful or anger towards someone who's threatening or trying to shame you, it's understandable, but I'd say um, we don't want to land there. We don't want to like stay there um, as if we can. So I, I'm so, wow, very rich uh, conversation. And I, I wanted to mention tonight is, uh, or today um, is the birthday of my teacher, uh, Jennifer Wellwood. And um, she, yeah, I wanna just kind of bring her into this space. I've learned just so much from her. And I want us to close with a poem of hers, which I love and kind of honoring her and um, yeah, all of those who are continuing to bring these teachings and this wisdom to us for thousands of years. I just, I feel super humbled um, by that and super grateful to Sangha. Um, oh, before I read the poem, I'll mention uh, next week, you guys are in for a real treat. Um, so a good friend of mine and colleague, a, a, a trained cultivating emotional balance teacher, but kind of a, a real, um, imp impressive figure in his own right. His name is Lobsang Tempa. Uh, he's a monastic. He is originally from Siberia, lives uh, primarily in Russia, but's in the United States for a couple months now. And he's a brilliant teacher, really exceptional teacher. And it turns out that both Chandra and I are out and he very um, generously offered to lead. <clears throat> he's just, yeah. <laughs> he's really impressive. I've gotten to teach with him a couple times. He came to the Dharma Collective once. Um, so yeah, he'll be, he'll be with you for slogan 50 next week. Um, okay, so I will offer this poem for us as kind of just a, a nice way to bring this evening to a close and to again, yeah, honor our teachers. Such a beautiful, beautiful thing when we can have that sense of devotion for um, how much these teachings can transform our lives. Takes a long time, but it's worth it. So this poem is called Unconditional. 
Willing to experience aloneness, I discover connection everywhere. Turning to face my fear, I meet the warrior who lives within. Opening to my loss, I gain the embrace of the universe. Surrendering into emptiness, I find fullness without end. Each condition I flee from pursues me. Each condition I welcome transforms me and becomes itself transformed into its radiant jewel-like essence. I bow to the one who has made it so, who has crafted this master game. To play it is pure delight, to honor its form, true devotion. Thanks, everybody.